Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome to this morning's study. As you can see, we're going to be looking at two solar eclipses. This is just a paper I've been working on, and it does relate to what we've been studying in regard to July 18, 2020, and some of the symbolic use of numbers. Uh, so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so grateful for each person. We pray for one another. Uh, you know the trials that we face. We know of, of Dwight's trials and Angela's, but we know that many of us have things that we have to face each day, and we need your grace and wisdom. Uh, we ask that we can trust in you in spite of what's happening around us, and that we can have assurance that you are in control of all of the events of our lives and of this world. We pray, Lord, that as we look at, again, at the symbolic use of numbers, and particularly as they relate uh, to uh, these solar eclipses, we ask for your spirit to give us a clear understanding. And we thank you uh, for the time that we have here, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I do have a, the paper that I'm working on. Of course, I'm not finished with it yet. Um, so this is just the title of the paper, Two Solar Eclipses, August 21st, 2017 to April 8th, 2024. And the reason that, that I originally thought of writing the paper is, of course, there's just all kinds of videos on YouTube talking about uh, this solar eclipse, these two different solar eclipses. And the one back in 2017, I paid a bit of attention to. 2017, of course, is seven years ago, and it was um, an important year in this movement. It's when the movement had begun the work of organization. So there's going to be an organizational meeting in Italy in 2017. And I don't believe that organization was of God. I believe that that was a mistake. If there was a mistake that this movement made, it was having Parminder in charge of organizing the movement. And that led to a major split in the movement. Um, in 2017, I ended up in September going to the School of the Prophets. And I was invited there to speak. I taught on... Um, the structure of prophetic chronology. And basically I did so because uh, many of the teachers weren't there. They were in Italy. And so uh, that's why I was there in 2017. As also there in 2018, Heidi and I were there for about five months um, into 2018 and, and 2019. But uh, in 2017, there's lots of things that were going on in this movement. There was the prediction before midnight. Um, on September 23rd, 2017, I'm going to present July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight, three days before midnight as a symbol. And so I noted this solar eclipse at the time. Um, and later on, when I understood the significance of the Revelation 12 sign prophecy, which we're going to look at a little bit here, you know, we will be able to sort of see what what the significance of these eclipses are. And I believe that they're that all of the different interpretations that are going on are misguided. So the first thing is there are eclipses in the past that are being referenced. And, and this one here, the Assyrian eclipse is a solar eclipse. It's uh, often called the Bursagali eclipse uh, because that in that eponym canon of the Assyrian kings. He would be the, the mayor of uh, Nineveh at the time. And this is an eclipse that happened on June 15th, 1763 BC. Uh, you see that little image, if you can see that, it says uh, 762 with a minus sign 010, or minus sign 0762, June 15th. That's because they're using a zero year. So that's why it says 762. And that eclipse is almost directly over uh, that area. Uh, the, the totality of it, it goes through Nineveh. It's seen in its totality in the city of Nineveh. Purple um, line? Is that the purple line? The blue line, yeah. The purple, blue line, whatever. I guess it's kind of... Oh. Yeah, probably right. It's purple. 
Yeah, so that line is the path of the eclipse. You can see that it actually crosses um, uh, northern Africa, uh, the Mediterranean. It goes through uh, the land of Israel. And um, just to the left of that center of it is going to be the city of Nineveh. So I'm not sure exactly how many miles that, and that would be the, um, what they call the, the, that's the place where there's the most totality is that place. That's the, the center of that eclipse. But anyway, um, people try to connect this to, uh, the preaching of Jonah. Now the problem is they use the, the chronology that's in Wikipedia, which is basically Edwin Thiel's chronology, which rejects the biblical chronology. So uh, they say that um, Jeroboam II ruled from 786 to 4, 746 BC, according to 2 Kings 14.25. Well, he, he ruled for 41 years. They have their 40 years. And so they have a, a bit of an explanation that this would be the time when Jonah was preaching, but that's not correct. So uh, Jeroboam II uh, was 723. B.C. to 782 B.C. That's when he was ruling, and it's going to be near the beginning of, or somewhere at the early part of Jeroboam II's reign, possibly that Jonah went to Nineveh and said that they had 40 days, right? It's going to be about 40 years later that the eclipse actually occurs. You know, it could be 30, 40 could be a bit more. There's not any way of exactly pointing out how far it was from when Nineveh repented to when the eclipse occurred, but it's about 40 years. Okay, so a lot's made of that uh, eclipse. Um, I also note about the Exodus eclipse. So this is an eclipse that I think is significant um, in that it's going to occur in Egypt in 1533 B.C., around the time of the Exodus, uh, specifically two weeks that's after a, the Exodus. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and, and the path of the eclipse crosses the Red Sea, not far from where the Israelites cross. And, and it, so it's, it's two weeks after the Exodus, right? So the Exodus, obviously, it occurs. They, they're going to leave on, leave on the 15th day of uh, the first month which is April 26th on the Julian calendar. And and that's going to be, you know, in connection, of course, with um, the full moon. And it's going to be at the new moon that you have the eclipse. So that's why it's about two weeks after. Oh, uh, Daniel asks here, uh, the Guma asks, why do some people place it on May 10th, 1533? And and that's because they're they're looking at the place where the eclipse um, uh, begins. So the thing about an, an eclipse, <clears throat> astronomers, uh, they have their day start at noon, not at midnight, by the way. And the eclipse is going to occur uh, just before sunset. The total eclipse is actually going to be about, uh, well, it depends on, you know, which if you're counting actual local time, based upon noon being um, 12 o'clock, right? So they didn't have uh, daylight savings and they didn't have time zones. So if you look at it, there, it's just after six o'clock that the eclipse is going to occur and it's going to occur for about uh, three minutes. So it, anyway, the eclipse actually starts way off in the West and where it starts, it's actually on the other time of the other side of the times, the what do they call it? The international date line. So that's why they say the eclipse is at uh, May 10th, 1532 is what they, they have listed. But it just has to do with how they're counting time. Okay, makes sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it kind of confused me at first. I have to take a look at it. But yeah, so technically they would... It's do the time of the eclipse starting on May 10th. But when you actually get to Egypt, it's going to be the day before May 9th, right? So yeah. really, really confusing sometimes how astronomers do things. 
So that eclipse anyway is is pretty interesting. So we can say that eclipses uh, have significance, but it's 1533. So the 1532 is using a Gregorian calendar with a zero year. That's why it says 1532, May 10th, 1532. So that's going to be May. In Egypt, it's going to be May 9th, 1533, because we're using the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian. And, and, it, and it's kind of weird because astronomers use, they use a zero year for their, which is a Gregorian idea, but they still use Julian dates. So they, they kind of mix the Julian and Gregorian together. It, it, it's, it's very confusing. And of course, the day starts at noon. And they use Julian day numbers, actually, mostly. Well, you so, said they, they see the day is starting at noon, you're saying? Astronomers start the day at noon. Because okay. right. it's much easier for astronomy, instead of having the days, you know, when you're going to give a date, it's just, it's going to include the whole night. Because astronomers generally look at things at nighttime, not at daytime, right? Right. Yeah, so... Uh, where you get the confusion is stuff that happens during the day, like an eclipse, that sometimes it'll give you two different dates, depending, you know, if it's crossing the international date line or not. Okay. <clears throat> now, we know that astronomical events are important. In Genesis 1, verse 14, it says, um, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, of course, uh, the signs, that's the ot, those are, uh, and in this case, it's plural otot. So that's just how you pluralize ot. <laughs> it's this doubling, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it means tokens, signs of God's judgments or blessings and miracles. And, and these literally are signs in the heavens. Right. So the sun and the moon were given to keep track of time to mark the seasons, the Moedim. That's the feasts, uh, the days, the Yamim. And that is the Yamim as in Arab and Boker, right? Evening and morning. And then the years, Shanim. But they're also given as signs. So we know that astronomical events can be significant. And, and we see in uh, lots of different places, but here in Revelation 6, verse 12, to 17. Um, it says, when I had opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island is moved out of its place and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. The great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. And it doesn't look like the King James that I have there. I'm not sure why. We might have to change that. And then um, we also see in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. and They shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So we can see that these harbingers for signs in the heavens, these are going to be fulfilled in Millerite history. We have the dark day in 1780. And we have uh, the falling of the stars in 1833. So there's all these verses that relate to that. Now, what I wanted to look at here then was in relationship to the time of the end, uh, we have some uh, early American eclipses. So this is in the paper. I don't want to go to it in too much detail here. But after America, after 1776, the first solar eclipse that's going to be witnessed in the United States is June 24th, 1778, right? So this is, you know, it's about, uh, 20, well, it's 20 years before the time of the end, right? Seven, 1798. And then there's going to be another one two years later, 
on October 27, 1780. So this second eclipse was preceded 161 days earlier by the great dark day of May 19, 1780. So it's interesting, in the year 1780, uh, where we have the, the great dark day, we also have an eclipse 161 days later. Now, of course, we know the date great dark day was not a solar eclipse because it was during a full moon. And we know it's one of the events, which was a fulfillment of Joel uh, 13, 15 and Matthew 24, 29 and others. Uh, these were part of the signs marking the end of the 1260 years of papal persecution as prophesied in Daniel 7, verse 25. So we may know that Ellen White says, and, and I need to add this, I just haven't put it in the paper, but that this dark day occurred how long after the prophecy was given by Joel? Anybody remember? What was that again? Ellen White says that this prophecy of the dark day, which is in Joel 3.15, occurred how long after the prophecy was given? How long is it after the prophecy was given? She she gives us a number of years. Okay, so how many years does she say from the giving of the prophecy to its fulfillment on May 19th, 1780? Anybody know how many years? We should all know this. Maybe people are just too shy. Is it 100 years? No, the prophecy was given 2,500 years earlier. So Joel gives this prophecy 2,500 years earlier. And she says it's about 20 years, something that um, I can't remember her exact wording, but when uh, prosec uh, persecution has ceased, about 25 years, I think she says, uh, before the time of the end. But anyway, if you put, you know, this period of time here, 2,500 years, and you add, you know, another 20 years, you would have 2520. So it's pretty close. It's one of those ways that you can see that there's this connection with the 2520. So Joel is going to be prophesying around the time of the fall of northern Israel. So it's just right after that, I believe, that he's going to uh, be writing his prophecy. So anyway, we have this prophecy of Joel that's fulfilled with this great dark day. And then we're going to have um, some more eclipses <coughs> or another. Uh, these two are going to happen in the 1800s. Uh, the first is going to be um, on June 16th, 1806, and the next one on September 17th, 1811. And they're going to create an X over America. I, I don't have a map of showing the X of these two eclipses, but, but they're going to create an X and they're going to cross this place called New Madrid. Okay. So New Madrid is a place that's originally in um, one of the territories. It's going to later become part of Missouri. And there's going to be um, some earthquakes connected to this. So there's going to be the New Madrid earthquake of 1811. So some people say that these were uh, warnings of the coming earthquake. Now, the first eclipse is an annular eclipse that occurred on June 16th, 1806. And it moved across continental U.S. from Baja, California, all the way to Massachusetts with the city of Detroit and other parts of the South, Michigan falling under its path of totality. 65 months, or 1919 days later, on September 17th, 1811, it was followed by an annular eclipse. Now, this should be a uh, total, I think I made a mistake here. Because one of them's a, um, a uh, yeah, so this one should be a total eclipse. I don't know why. I'm going to have to check that again. So an annular eclipse is just the, the moon is um, is a little bit farther away from the Earth, so it doesn't quite do a total eclipse. You see a ring. That's why annular. Um, as noted earlier, this eclipse is uh, noteworthy because of its proximity to a series of earthquakes centered around New Madrid. These earthquakes followed the 1811 eclipse 90 days later, beginning on December 16th, 1811, 
Um, I don't know why I have that written twice, so I'm going to have to correct that. I don't know. With a magnitude of 8.2 and uh, with an aftershock of 7.4. And then two more similar earthquakes followed 38 days later on January 23rd and then 14 days after that on February 7th in 1812. They are the most powerful earthquakes ever recorded east of the Rockies in the continental U.S. At the time, New Madrid was then part of Louisiana Territory, which President Eli's in the state of Missouri. So um, now the next eclipse, I do have a mark. That, so these next two eclipses, they're going to create an X over uh, this territory, which would be in, uh, I guess that's Georgia, it looks like. Just hard to see this map clearly. Uh, no, that's not going to be Georgia. Mississippi, Arkansas. Yeah, that must be Georgia. I'm not, not certain. Anyway, so you see here this, uh, these eclipses. There's going to be February 12th, 1831. Now, what do we know about 1831 in Bible prophecy? What, what's the importance of 1831? According to Marite history, is, is it not the year when William Mary received the license to start preaching? Okay, so he's going to do his first preaching in 1831. He receives his light, his license in 1833, right? So, so they are connected. And sometimes people get the two confused, right? So in 1831, he begins to present his message for the first time. Um, and in 1833, he's going to get his license. Now, also at that time, there's a guy named Nat Turner who's going to start an insurrection with against the slaveholders. And so some people connect that because he, he actually takes this as an inspiration that God is leading him. Now, also, this eclipse is paired with the total solar eclipse of November 30th, 1834. So you're going to have three years later, uh, another eclipse. And this crossed the southeastern United States. And uh, a map maker named Charles Bowen, he made this 1833 map where it shows the eclipses crossing paths. So, so he made this map in 1831, and he, since there was an eclipse that year and there was one coming up, he put the path of these eclipses on this map, right? And then you're going to see there's, you know, solar eclipses in 1860 and 1869 and 1878. And I have a little chart here with all these different eclipses, and it looks like I kind of messed it up somehow. I'm not sure how I did that. No, that was no good. I'm going to have to figure out what's wrong with this. It must have to move these over somehow. Anyway, I'll work on that later. So one thing that we will see here, and I have a list of 20th century American eclipses. Eclipses are very common. There can be as many as five eclipses, solar eclipses in a year that that could be seen from Earth. Generally, there's about two. Sometimes you get three. Sometimes you get four. Very rarely five. I think it's Five eclipses in a year have occurred only 25 times in the last 5,000 years. So, you know, so, but the thing is, from a local point of view, the chances of you seeing a total solar eclipse are limited, right? So most of these solar eclipses are going to occur in places either over uh, large bodies of water, like the Pacific or the Atlantic Oceans, or in uninhabited places. They could be witnessed in, like, very southern parts of the world or very northern parts um, where people don't live, right? So so it's just not common to see a total solar eclipse as an individual. So, I mean, if you get, if you're living in a place, uh, for instance, where those solar eclipses are going to cross paths within a short period of time, uh, like three years apart or six years apart or seven years apart, which is, which is, it's common that you're going to have an eclipse cross another one in a short period of time. So whether there's going to be somebody living there is uncertain. But in this case, we do have with these two eclipses, the one in 2017 and the one in 2024, uh, a lot being made about the places where they cross paths. And um, so people have all kinds of theories. There's lots of different town names that people are going to address, which we're going to look at a little bit, why they think that's important. But you can see there's there's lots of eclipses 
in the United States. These are American eclipses listed here. You know, you got, uh, you know, one, one right in 1900, and then you got 1918, 1923, 1925, 1930, 1932, 1945, 1954, 1963, the year I was born, 1970, 1979, right? And then we go for quite a while without an eclipse in America a solar eclipse that's viewable in America until we get to 2017. Well, actually, I think there might be another one in, um, yeah, late in the early 21st century, but just not seen by as many people. Now, the other thing is we have the Internet now. So back then, you know, we might not even have heard about some of these eclipses unless you were uh, going to be affected by them. I know the one in 1979, that one, I did see uh, a partial eclipse. I made a, like a pinhole camera in a, in a cereal box. And then I could see that, you know, a little bit of the sun was being, by the shadow going through this pinhole, you could see that a little bit of the sun was being covered. But I, I was in Alberta. This was more over further east of us that, that it would have been seen. But not that far east. It, 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 it covered quite a bit of the sun. It wasn't just a little corner. And I did see one, uh, a solar eclipse, a partial solar eclipse at sunset in 1988. Just as the sun was going down, you know, a little bit of the sun was covered by the moon. But you know, I've never witnessed a total solar eclipse. So then that would probably be true for most of you. Is there anybody here who's witnessed a total solar eclipse? I did in 2017. Yeah, because I was wondering if you had, because it did go through Oregon. Now, did you have to drive? Yeah, I drove up to Springfield. Yeah, yeah. Springfield and saw it and drove back. So so what was that experience like? It was uh, unique. (laughs) So it was worth the drive? Yeah, it was. Yeah. (laughs) Everybody was excited. It was in a uh, pumpkin patch. Out in the middle of nowhere, there's <laughs> other people out there. I think I think I seen one in the eighties, late eighties. Uh, well, there wouldn't have been one in the eighties because I have all the American eclipses. Unless you were someplace that wasn't America. No, I would. I just I know I seen an eclipse sometime in other. Well, maybe, maybe, when it, maybe in seventy nine, but I don't know. It might have been in seventy nine because I was working for. State, um, North Carolina State at the time was doing road work in a, in Caswell County, I think it was. Where was that? Caswell County. State, state. North Carolina State. Okay. okay. Well, I don't know if that one would have been seen. I mean, I could look it up and maybe there was one in 1970 in South Carolina, but, uh, Anyway, I, I, noticed I, can... the crickets, I noticed the crickets started chirping more when the when the when the was totality. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They, they all think. Well, it's anyway, nice. I saw one. Whether it was in the seventy nine or it's... yeah. Okay, okay. So you seen one sometimes. So I could look that up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And Eldon was down in Tennessee at the time, um, so he says he saw saw that one. Okay, interesting. Now, I, you know, I thought of going to see it, but at the time I was moving up up north, and uh, we we were in the area. We went through the area in 2017 where the eclipse was going to be, but that was a bit earlier, so I definitely didn't get to see that eclipse. Now, the idea, the prophetic significance of solar eclipses. So we can see that these things are not as rare as people think, and If you're going to put these eclipses and you're going to say, well, this event happened in connection with an eclipse. Well, there's lots of events and lots of eclipses. And, you know, you we wouldn't even know about many of these eclipses, except because of uh, social media nowadays. In the past, people might not even know that some eclipse happened. And definitely not every place in the world is witnessing these eclipses when they occur. And, and so you might have to say, well, how can we decide what that eclipse means, right? So in the past, obviously, people would be surprised by a solar eclipse happening. 
And it would make sense that if something, some momentous event had happened shortly after a solar eclipse, that they would connect that to meaning. But I would think from a biblical perspective, we would have to look at how these are tied to prophecy. That is, for me to just say, well, there's a solar eclipse, you know, it crossed the United States in a big X, these two solar eclipses. And that means that they are significant. They're a warning to America or a judgment upon America. It's happened before. And we can't even connect them to anything with America specifically. Now, there's a comment here about Madrid. So New Madrid is this place where they're going to have these earthquakes, which means a place of abundant waters. It's an Arabic word. This may have some connection with Revelation 17.1, referring to New Madrid in this document. Of course, Spain was a big player in the first inquisition under the return of papal supremacy. So this is, Angela actually makes this comment. So the 2017 eclipse in Salmon Arm. So, well, that eclipse wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen a totality in Salmon Arm because it was just in America. Anyway, so yeah, I don't know the significance, like with the New Madrid earthquakes, there's lots of eclipses where we can't really attach any significance to them. And we don't have a prophecy about the New Madrid earthquakes. We could say that because of those earthquakes, they're going to occur in connection with, what do they call that war again, between where William Miller is going to be, that's going to be connected to his conversion. That's going to happen in the war of 1812. Yeah, 1812. So you're going to have those earthquakes starting in 2000 or 1811 going into 1812. And maybe there's some kind of connection there prophetically with the end, the time of the end. But there would be a connection with prophetic periods. So we could kind of accept that. Now, when it comes to different types of things like the dark day, we know there's also going to be the falling of the stars. And that's going to be November 12th, 1833. And so we could take those two eclipses, the one in 1831 and the one in 1834, may be connected with the falling of the stars, right? That's going to be the Leonid meteor shower that's seen across the United States and an spectacular, unlike any before it or after it. Now, I did experience the Perseid meteor shower, August 11th, 1980, right? So that was the evening that I was converted. So I'm going to try to get this done here. I've got about 20 minutes. Now, a big deal is made on the internet regarding the names of towns that are going to experience totality, experience this solar eclipse. Now, it was noted that there was seven municipalities named Salem that experienced not the, well, I got to get this right, that experienced the 2017 eclipse. Now, one of them would have been Salem, Oregon, I guess, eh? I can't remember. I have a list. Yeah, Salem, yeah. Salem. Right. And now there is somewhere between 38 to 42 places in the United States named Salem. So it's a pretty common name. And you could count, you know, things like there's counties, you know, that are named Salem, you know. It's a pretty common thing. It's a pretty common name. Now, of course, it's an old name for Jerusalem, right? So which means the city of peace and Salem means peace. And so people have made this huge deal about if there was seven cities named Salem that witnessed this totality of this eclipse. Now, in 2024, there's purportedly seven places in the U.S. named Nineveh that are in the eclipse path. Now, there's, here I put 38 towns named Salem, but there's actually only two of the towns named Nineveh that are going to experience the path of totality. 
So there isn't seven. Now, you know, why people say that there's seven? Well, you know, there's some that are going to witness partial eclipses, but most of continental United States is going to witness a partial eclipse of, of some sort or other um, with this eclipse. I mean, there might be parts where it's just too far away, but most are going to witness some kind of eclipse. Some won't be noticeable unless you, you actually look at the sun because it won't really dim it that much. You'd have to be much closer to totality to notice the shadow because there is a shadow, the, the umbra, it's, uh, it's called the penumbra. Right? The umbra is actually the place where you have uh, the eclipse itself and the penumbra is the place outside of the eclipse, but does experience a shadow. If I remember correctly. Okay, so, but the question is, why would this even matter that we can pick names of cities? I guess, you know, one of the places that's where these eclipses cross is a place called Rapture. And so, you know, some evangelicals are speculating that the secret rapture is going to happen on April 8th. You know, these types of things, they... I understand why they appeal to people, but obviously the secret rapture is not true. So the next thing I want to look at is just Nashville. So in 2017, uh, we're going to see that this um, eclipse crossed, that it was witnessed in Nashville. So I noted that back after we started talking about Nashville. I looked back at yeah, so Angela has some stuff there about amazing discoveries. Are you talking about um, uh, Don Frost's video? Is that where you saw this? Yeah, I haven't been looking at this stuff at all, so I'm just saying, well, possibly my, I want to see for myself. If Is yeah. there an in event, such and such a state, and such and such a state, and does the shadow of the eclipse travel yeah, in a direct uh, line through these cities? Yeah, I, I've done it. Uh, I've already done okay. it in my paper i'm gonna have the map and all that no it's not true um okay i'm glad to know that but i will still look yeah i mean there's some that are close they're going to see a partial eclipse but there's there's one that's quite out of line with it and 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 you have to look at the fact of of you know how much of the eclipse you know there's only goes through two places named Nineveh. And it doesn't get to. All right. Uh, That's good. They were saying and, eight. And, mm. and, yeah. Well, the eight is supposed to be Nineveh, Nova Scotia, but it doesn't. It, it's right. not going to pass over Nineveh, Nova Scotia. So and there are going to be towns named Salem uh, that are going to see totality again. I don't know if there, any of them are the same Salem, but, you know, Salem's such a popular name. Nineveh, there's eight places in the United States called Nineveh. One in Canada called Nineveh. Two of the places in the United States will experience the eclipse in totality. And almost every place in the United States is going to witness some of the eclipse, right? So, I mean, if we're going to include the penumbra, I'd have to look at that in more detail. But I think some of them are outside of that. That is, they're not going to experience any shadow. But, but those things are a little bit subjective as well. Okay, so... uh we know that people make a big deal about these ta town names, but with Nashville, we have a prediction that was made, right? So we made a prediction regarding Nashville. Now, that eclipse in 2017 was 33 days before uh, September 23rd, 2017. On September 23rd, 2017, there's going to be the Revelation sign prophecy. Um, but also I'm going to present July 18 as a symbol of the prediction before midnight on that day. So you can see that that's uh, 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And um, so if you add the 33 days to 777, you're going to get uh, 810 days prior to um, November 9th, 2019, that uh, that eclipse occurs. And so with the 8810, what does that symbolize? 81. Anybody know what 81 represents? The priesthood. 
Second okay. Chronicles 20, I think it is. Yeah, and, and it represents also, uh, yeah, the priesthood. We connect it somewhat with Midnight, with Ellen White being 81 at, um, in 1909, whichever was the last general conference she went to. Okay, so anyway, what you see in front of here is just, I mean, I just wrote this this morning, so it probably has typos in it. But we're going to see that um, this total solar eclipse, you can see in the top image, it's going to show Nashville and shows Tennessee. And Nashville is going to experience an eclipse, which actually is 156, one minute and 56 seconds and 44 seconds less than the center of the path closest to their location. So um, I was telling you, Ryan, it was one minute and 44 seconds, but I just had read it wrong. So one minute and 56 seconds, 44 seconds less. So it's going to be... Um, let me see. So that was in 2017. Now, this one in 2024 is only going to, they're going to see 97% totality in Nashville, right? So they're not going to see totality. So it doesn't cross them twice. But it is going to be seen in an important location, which is Bonnerdale, Arkansas. Now, that's about 20 miles west of Hot Springs. And that was the main town where we would do shopping when I was at the School of the Prophets. Bonnerdale is uh, the town that Jeff uses as his address. He's just a few miles from Bonnerdale. I can't remember how far, maybe 10 miles, something like that. And so Jeff will experience uh, this total solar eclipse. Now, in Bonnerdale, the totality of the eclipse is going to be 3 minutes, 51.9 seconds. So that's a symbol of 391 and a half. It's got all the digits of that. Pretty long eclipse. Yeah, it's it's fairly long. Yeah, it's a fairly long eclipse. So 3 minutes. I think, I think the longest one was around 7 minutes, right? The yeah. Eclipse. Yeah, you can get something around 7 minutes. Yeah. And it depends where you are along the path of totality. So some there's a like a place where there's the greatest amount of eclipse that you know people scientists want to go to. Hope they always hope that the weather's going to be good. I know there's one scientist way back in ancient times he went to, not really ancient times but like a couple hundred years ago or something, and he wanted to see an eclipse. And when he got there, it was overcast and rainy, and um. You didn't really get to do some of his experiments. I can't remember the guy or when it was exactly. But now there are some interesting details regarding this. So let me see if, if I've written this down. Yes. So but one of the things about the eclipse on April 8th, 2024, is it's 1,360 days after July 18, 2020. So if we remember that... Uh, the Jeff is going to speak on December 30th, 2023, uh, basically for the first time after uh, July 18, 2020. That's going to be 1,260 days. So this eclipse on April 8th follows 100 days later. So it's going to be 1,360 days from July 18, 2020 to April 8th, 2024. The interesting thing about uh, the number 1360, if you Put it into base eight. So 1360 is obviously base 10. That's what we always use. But base eight, which is octal, it actually produces the number 2520. So since that eclipse is passing, it's going to be seen in, in at, you know, future for America. 1300 degrees after July 18. Yes. The, the, um, base, what is base? Is it, is it like, um, have to do with music? No, base, base is like, base 10 is, you have 10 fingers. Right. And, right. So there's like, there's 10 digits, right? Right. Say there's only eight. Okay. From, from zero to seven. So base eight doesn't have, uh, an eight in it, right? Just goes zero to seven and keeps repeating over. Okay. All right. What does, uh, uh, what is, uh, uh how do you octal say it? Just means, octal just means base eight. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so it's going to be 2520 in base eight, which I think is pretty interesting. So 
So an eight is a symbol that we've used. It's actually, Jeff has done lots of presentations on the number eight, right? And it's something that we've used before, base eight and base 16, um, which is eight plus eight. Okay, so in, in base 16, they have to have other symbols. They usually use letters uh, to represent uh, numbers, right? Because there's not enough numbers. But so we have 25, 20 days, if we count them in base eight, from July 18th to April 8th, 2024, when Jeff would be able to witness this uh, eclipse in totality. And, and I'm suggesting that this that this is connected uh, to the rejection of July 18, 2020. That is, we can connect the first eclipse to the uh, 777 days from September 23rd, 2017, where we get the July 18 symbol. And then we have uh, November 9th, 2019. And then we have the 252 days to July 18th. And then from July 18th, there's 25, 20 days in base eight to this eclipse that Jeff will be able to witness. If he goes outside, um, I guess even if he stays inside. So I think it's, I think it is significant as a marker. Now we know that two days after April 8th is going to be the first day of the first month, April 10th, right? So you can see that uh, the new moon wouldn't be seen, obviously, on the day of an eclipse or the day before. It's going to be seen a day or two after. And that's why the first day of the first month is going to be a couple of days after the eclipse. Because eclipses occur during uh, what we call the new moon, but it's not going to be visible until, you know, a day or two later. So, so this is, this I think, is the significance of this eclipse that it is a message to this movement. And we can see that it's a judgment against the rejection of July 18, 2020. It shows it's a warning, right? Now, some people may not believe it, right? So people can easily dismiss it. But I don't think that we should, you know, definitely we're not going to say that this is about a judgment on America in some particular way. You know, that's definitely not the secret rapture going to be happening. Um, we're not tying it into futurism or anything like that. But we can tie it in to what this movement has experienced, that it is part of that structure. Any comment on that? And you can see the path of totality there, Bonnerdale's by Hot Springs down here. There's the center of the total eclipse, but they're going to not experience the center of it. Pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. Okay. Now I do also have, yeah. Now I just wanted to go back, and I'm probably going to do this in a different order. This is just me writing. Uh, I got the Revelation 12 sign and the eclipse, right? So I just mentioned about here about the Revelation 12 sign, September 23rd, 2017, and that should not be in italics. So we're familiar with. Uh, you know, the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars. Um, and we often apply this to the birth of Christ in 4 BC. That's what it's, it's talking about. And then there's lots of different biblical references that we can use to understand the interpretation of that. The sun and the moon and the stars from the story of Joseph, the serpent and the woman back to Genesis 3.15, uh, the sun and the moon and the stars in the fourth day of creation. And the dragon representing uh, uh, Satan, but also pagan Rome at the time of the birth of Christ and the 1260 days that follow, uh, 1260 years. Uh, was there eclipse in 4 BC? I, I don't know. Um, uh, so I, I guess I could look that up. Thanks for that question. And, and so we know that these... 1260 days from Daniel 725 refer to the period of the papal persecution that began in the 6th century. So that's the 1260 years we know of. Now, dispensationalist interpretation of this passage uses futurism, right? So they look at what's happening in the sky and they interpret this as the beginning of 1260 days until the rapture. 
right? That's originally how they most of them interpreted it. Now, normally there's nine stars above the constellation Virgo. So the woman and the dragon are the constellations of Virgo and Draco. And uh, uh, so normally there's nine, but on in September of 2017, there's going to be three extra stars above her head. That's going to be Mercury, Venus, and Mars that are going to be that were seen above the head of the Virgin, Virgo. And the moon is going to be under her feet. That's at the time of the new moon because the sun is in Virgo. That's why the woman's clothed with the sun. And so on on the first day of of the seventh month, on the first of Tishri, that is Rosh Hashanah, uh, you're going to see uh, this new moon under her feet. That's just going to be the, the 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 thin crescent moon would be visible on the evening of beginning September 23rd. Now, there was also, um, it says that the woman is uh, pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Uh, now, it says uh, the planet Jupiter transversed Virgo's womb after entering it on November 20th, 2016, and exited the womb approximately 42 weeks later. That's the maximum length of human gestation. Uh, normally, human gestation is 39 weeks, which is 273 days. There was also the suggestion that the comet Borisov, dubbed the Conception Comet, entered, entered Virgo, impregnating her three days before Jupiter entered Virgo's womb. This complete alignment occurred on September 23, 2017, over Jerusalem. This co coincided with Rosh Hashanah, which commenced the Feast of Trumpets, and marked the end of the rabbinic Jewish year, 5777, uh, sometimes abbreviated to the significant number 777, right? So there was all of this stuff. Now, this is a, um, a gif of this sign, Revelation 12 sign. So you can see they got uh, the woman's womb there. They show Virgo, the constellations. They show the, the, the planets that make up the 12 stars above her head. And uh, they show the conception comet, uh, or not the conception comet, the Jupiter moving and staying in that womb, in that in Virgo for that period of time, uh, 42 months, which is interesting number, by the way. So that's why they attach to it, you know, this uh, three and a half year tribulation period, 42 months, 1260 days. There's all of these different symbols that are there. So obviously, uh, we know that November 9th, uh, 2019 is 30 years to the day from the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that 777 days that end the rabbinic year are going to count, uh, seven or from 577, 777 days to November 9th, 2019. Where's the comet? I don't see the comet. Yeah, let me show the comet. I, I didn't show the comet. That's just the, they're just showing the, Jupiter moving there. You have to look at other images to see the Conception Comet. So the Conception Comet enters Virgo's womb three days before Jupiter does. Oh, I got you. Okay. And then Jupiter stays there for 42 months. Right. So we can see the connection with 1260 days. Right. As a symbol. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm just looking at a question here. Okay, I don't know about the magnitude of the April 8th eclipse it has to Africa and Uganda. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that you will see any of that eclipse in Africa. I don't think that you would. Just not 100% certain. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't see anything. Okay. So, so I, I think it's kind of interesting. I obviously I have to put this paper together in much, much better detail. So lots of things I have to add. I have to correct all my typos. But but I do think the significance of this eclipse is more uh, for this movement. But all of these other, um, the fact that we have Nashville and then Arkansas, right, Bonnerdale, experiencing this uh, these two eclipses, I think that would tie it together. Now, the time between these two eclipses is six years, seven months and 18 days. So we can see the, six, the seven months and 18 days obviously are significant. And um, 
And then we're going to have from April 10th, we're going to have six years to the first day of the first month in 2030. So, so there's a connection there as well, but I know it's, it's not, it's not a great presentation because it's kind of scattered a bit, but any final comments before we close with prayer? Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, but definitely we're not, you know, predicting anything on April 8th other than I I predict it to be a solar eclipse, but uh, that's, that's the most I can predict. Okay. The odds odds of that lining up with the events in the movement are pretty slim. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, that, you know, especially Nashville and then Bonnerdale and uh, the other symbol symbols that are attached with these spans of time. um, Yeah. I think that we would have to say that it at least is a message to us and about rejecting July 18th. There's, there's more in it here. I just didn't want to go into too much detail. It'll be in the paper. People can read it once it's done. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the studies that we've had today. I pray for each person again. You know that there's uh, trials that we all face, and so we give our lives to you. We leave them into your hands. And um, we know, Lord, that there's many disappointments that we experience. We ask, Lord, that we can trust in you in spite of what happens. Thank you for these messages regarding the symbolic use of numbers and uh, how they relate to these eclipses and to this movement. And that we can see your hand, not just in the events of the world, but in our personal lives as well. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name now.